All the saints are, of course, a unique work of art of God. They're all gloriously different. Someone has said sinners are depressingly similar. Sin tends to reduce us to a lowest common denominator, but the saints are all wonderfully different. Despite that, some of them, for some reason not always clear, seem to attract the imagination of people of the church more than others. In our own time, we think, of course, of saints like St. Therese, St. Maximilian Kolbe. But in the early church, the saint we celebrate today, St. Lawrence, really captured everyone's attention. So much so that he's one of the saints we have special readings for, we have a special office for him. He somehow imprinted himself in the Christian imagination from earliest times. Perhaps it's something to do with his own wonderful sense of humor and imagination. He has said, when uh, asked by the Roman inquisitors to bring out the treasures of the church, no doubt hoping to lay their hands on all the gold plate or whatever they thought the church had, he brought out a selection of the poor and presented them to the Roman authorities and said, here are our treasures. When he himself was being tortured, when he was uh, on the, on the being, being burnt on the gridiron in the famous pictures, at one point he's actually supposed to have said, turn me over, I'm done on that side. Whether he uh, did actually say that, whether anybody could quite say that under torture is not true, but it seems to be historically true. And indeed, one of the later writers of the church attributed the conversion of the city of Rome to St. Lawrence's martyrdom. He died at a very significant time in church history, in the year 258. The first 300 years of the church were marked by martyrdom and suffering. It's a very interesting contrast with the beginnings of other religions. If you compare, for example, Christianity with Islam, Islam began almost immediately with conquer, conquering and with power and with military might. Christianity was born amid great suffering, martyrdom, persecution. It wasn't till about 50 years after the death of St. Lawrence that the Roman emperor himself, Constantine, underwent a conversion which led him to tolerate the Christian faith. What happened to the Christian faith after that? Well, it became free to be practiced in the Roman Empire. Eventually, it became the official state religion, which I suppose it was in Europe until fairly recently. But of course, for that freedom, there was a price to pay. There was a compromise that set in with the standards of the world. One modern theologian has said, the normal state of the Christian is martyrdom. In other words, what St. Lawrence and others went through in those first 300 years was, in a way, what every Christian should consider as normal, not something exceptional. St. Peter, writing to Christians from Rome in the first century, says to them, you should not consider the trials and persecutions you are going through as anything exceptional. After all, Christ went through them himself. He humbled himself and we must do the same. This does not mean, of course, that every Christian literally has to be a martyr. The great Saint Augustine, when he comments on St. Lawrence's martyrdom, tells us that there are many other ways of serving Christ, but all of them in some way involve the joyful acceptance of suffering. That is what Jesus calls taking up our cross every day, or in the Gospels, he says, like a wheat grain, being prepared to fall on the ground, being prepared apparently to fail. Who would have thought from the Roman authorities that St. Lawrence was a great success? And yet his martyrdom, like that of so many others, prepared the ground for a rich harvest of souls, the conversion of the entire Roman Empire. What does this mean for us? It means that Whatever daily sufferings we endure, they could be great ones, they could be little ones, 
we have to have the attitude of Christ to them. We have to be prepared to take them up joyfully, allowing God to use them to purify us and to bring others to him. The curie of ours, the great uh, parish priest of the 19th century, who himself suffered so much, spoke very simply to his parishioners, who after all were simple people like us, farming people. He said, when you get up in the morning, there are three things you should do. First of all, say to God, everything I do today, I want to do for you. I want to do it out of love for, for your glory. Secondly, say to him, whatever happens to me today, particularly whatever sufferings I endure, I want to offer them joyfully to you, knowing that you have allowed them to come to me in union with the, with the sacrifice of Christ. But he said a third thing, most importantly of all, say to God, but I can do nothing of myself. So give me, own, give me always the help of your Holy Spirit. What are these sufferings that we may endure? Over the last few weeks, I've been accompanying a couple of people who suffered tremendously because false allegations were made against them. In one case, a completely false allegation involving abuse of a child. Fortunately, they have both been cleared, but he shared with me the immense agony and anxiety that this caused him, as we can well imagine. Something like that is a great suffering which we may not be called to endure. It's almost halfway to martyrdom itself. For most of us, most of the time, it won't be dramatic things like that. Though it helps, I think, to reflect on these things and on the martyrdom of the martyrs, to remind ourselves to put in, into proportion the sufferings we endure. For most of us, it will be smaller things. It may be a, a, an illness, a pain, a chronic illness that we have that we don't seem to be able to get rid of. It may be some plan that doesn't work out, leading us to feel that we're a failure. It may be some person who consistently irritates us. It may be some dispute in our family or in our parish that won't seem to go away. And When these things come to us, we have to say to ourselves, this is a test. Am I a true follower of Christ or only a sham one. If I'm a true follower of Christ, I will immediately turn to the Holy Spirit and say, look, you can see how tempted I am to complain, to be negative, to fight back, to be resentful. This is human nature. This is what St. Paul calls the flesh. Give me the help of your Holy Spirit so that I may joyfully take up this cross and offer it in union with your Son, Jesus, for the salvation of the world. If we do this, as the Curie of ours says, again in another place, it's only the first step on the way of the cross that is painful. Once we have taken up our cross with Christ, we actually experience a joy. And of course, we will sooner or later experience the resurrection, the paschal mystery. Who can teach us better what this means than Our Lady herself? Look at her at the foot of the cross. St. Bernard, questioning himself and questioning Our Lady, as it were, says to us, why did Our Lady grieve so intensely if she knew and believed firmly that her son would rise again? Did it mean that she, her faith in the resurrection wavered? Not at all, he says. It was simply that her grief was utterly pure, utterly unselfish. When we grieve, when we mourn, when we complain, there's always a little bit of self in us. Not so with Our Lady. This is why it's so important to consecrate ourselves to her, or to God, more strictly speaking, through her every day. To offer to her our works in that famous prayer of St. Louis de Montfort, we offer her the very value of our good actions, past, present, and future, leaving to her the full and entire right of disposing of them. We also offer to her our sufferings, asking that she teach us how to suffer as she did, a pure, unselfish suffering. In this way, both our actions and our sufferings will draw us closer to Christ, and we too will be used for the salvation of others 
in ways that we may never suspect. O Immaculata, Virgin Mother of the Church and Refuge of Sinners, we join together to consecrate ourselves to your Immaculate Heart. We promise to pray the Rosary, to listen to the Word of God, to obey his commandments, to participate in the solemn feasts of the Church, to seek strength in the sacraments, especially reconciliation in the Holy Eucharist. We pray that we may always be ready to offer our actions, prayers, and sacrifices to anticipate the triumph of the Lord's kingdom in our souls, in those of our brothers and sisters, in our parish family, and in the entire world. Amen. Amen.